So we'll be recording the webinars and, and sending all record all recordings along with a copy of the presentation following um, each webinar through email. So a little bit about this series, each webinar will cover a different topic related to value added products. The first webinar will start by discussing how to assess the viability of your value added product idea. And the information in today's webinar is really intended to help you whether or not you decide to apply for the USDA's value added producer grant. Also, just a brief note, we extended today's webinar time to allow enough time for presentations and questions and answer. So we anticipate the webinar going until 1 p.m. Pacific time, um, but we will end earlier if we need to. In webinars two and three, you can expect to learn more about the value added producer grant, including eligibility requirements and application tips. And then in each webinar, you can also expect to hear from a guest speaker who has experience with value added products in some capacity. Today, our guest speaker is Marilee Olson from Preserve Farm Kitchens, and we're very happy to have Marilee, and we'll hear from her later in the presentation. Um, all the content for this webinar was created with in collaboration with Ellen Raleigh from Ellen Raleigh Creative and Strategy, and we're happy to have Ellen here today to answer questions and introduce herself a little bit later. Um, a bit about Ellen's business, Ellen Raleigh Creative and Strategy helps farms and food businesses launch and grow profitable product lines. Her go-to-market services include organic and food safety compliance, grant writing, and product strategy. Ellen, in addition to being here, will also be our guest speaker in the third webinar. Also, um, a quick note about this webinar. The content here is meant to be educational, um, and it is it is um, broad in scope rather than a how to guide for your business. And so we highly recommend if these concepts are new to you to get direct assistance from an expert um, or reach out to us if you have any follow up questions. Also note that some of the concepts that we introduced today will be discussed in a simpler way than they might um, occur in real life. So just a brief introduction to CAF. If anyone is, um, here is new to the organization, we are a nonprofit located with staff located throughout the state. And we offer a number of services to support farmers related to technology, food safety, wildfire resilience, um, connecting farmers to markets, helping farmers adopt ecological farming practices, and engaging farmers for policy advocacy in Sacramento, as well as in Washington, DC. CAF also runs the California Small Farm Conference, which takes place every year in around late February, early March. So if you all are new to CAF or wanna learn more, I encourage you all to check out our website. So your presenters for this part of the presentation are me. I am the Farmer Services Program Manager at CAF. I use she, her pronouns. And Kaylee Feierisel, who is the Farmer Services Director, is also joining us. And you can expect to hear from Kaylee in just a bit. So as we begin this first webinar, I just want to name our main learning objectives to give you all an idea of um, what you can expect to learn about today. So after attending the webinar, you all should be able to determine how to evaluate viability of your value added product idea. You can also expect to receive information about scaling up production of your value added product and hear directly from a successful co-packer in California who brings who works with farmers to bring their value added products to light to life. And we will also provide resources throughout this mod, this webinar for continued learning. To start, we wanna make sure that everyone has a solid and a similar understanding of what value added agriculture means. Um, we'll start with the USDA definition because it is the definition used to evaluate the value added product grant applications. The USDA defines value added four ways. It's a change in the physical state or form of a product, for example, making strawberries into jam. It's also the production of a product in a manner that enhances its value, 
An example of this would be organically produced products. It's also the physical segregation of an agricultural commodity or product in a manner that results in the enhancement of the value of the commodity or product. An example of this would be non-GMO produced products. And then finally, products marketed as local are also considered value added. An example of this would be um, local raw honey. In general and in a less technical definition, value added means increasing the value of raw agricultural commodities through processing. And a key component of value added agriculture is that the farm receives a greater portion of revenue from the value added products as compared to the raw agricultural commodity. There are many reasons to pursue a value added product or a value added business venture as a farmer. Some of the main benefits of incorporating value added agriculture into your business are that it generates a higher return. It allows business diversification into a, a new potentially high value market. It extends the production season, sometimes uses imperfect or cosmetically damaged crops that are not suitable for market. And it has the potential to create brand identity or develop brand loyalty. There are many factors to consider when it comes to producing a value added product from scratch, deciding to scale up an existing product or diversifying your product lines. An example of diversifying product lines would be going from selling salve to selling both soaps and salves. Our hope is that this webinar speaks to folks at different points in their value added product journey. We're going to introduce many of the key questions and activities that you should consider using the product development process that's illustrated on this slide. Answering the questions presented throughout this webinar and using them to guide your decision making can hopefully help ensure that your product ideas result in a profitable product. And keep in mind that this process will look different for everyone and it might be a bit more iterative than it is linear as it is displayed on this slide. Each decision will affect others. For example, your product type and packaging will affect your labels and your scale will affect your cost and production plans. We have a poll to launch. I'm hoping Kaylee can help me out with that. Um, to see where yeah, you I can all launch, are. I can launch that, Grace. Um, however, I'm not seeing an option for me to respond in the chat box to attendees. So I don't know if there's a setting oh, you, you can know change what? or do you yeah. see, are you able to do that? Um, let me see. I think I need to make you co-host. Yeah, actually I don't have the polls either right now. Okay, there you go. You should have co-host. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, here we go. Poll one. Thanks, Kaylee. So yeah, we want to get an idea of where folks are in their value added product process. So we have a few different options. You all can start responding and then we'll close it up once most folks have responded. Okay, we'll do about 10 more seconds. We've got about 80%, so I'm gonna end the poll. Pretty good spread here, um, as expected in all the different categories. Yeah, I just shared the results so folks on the call can see where others are coming from. Um, looks like most of the folks here are just getting started. So hopefully the information you learned today can be um, helpful as you start to dig into your value added product venture a bit more. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing now. All right, let's keep going. So when we were putting together the content for this webinar, we were thinking of a way to help kind of instill some of these concepts instead of just going over them at a very high level. So to help demonstrate how to assess product viability through the product development process, we're going to use an example of a value added product and take it through the development process. 
So let's pretend that I'm a farmer who successfully grows perennial herbs among other crops. I dry the herbs every year for my own use and give them to friends and family. I receive feedback every year that they love the herbs and wish they were available year round. So I wanna start selling my herbs at local farmer's markets because it seems like an easy way to add value to a relatively low maintenance crop. And I've noticed that no one else in my community sells local organic dried herbs. To start, my goals are to assess this business, business expansion through a small batch test run that requires a low startup cost and mostly using, uses existing infrastructure. So let's go ahead and get started. Idea generation is the first stage of the product development process, and it's where your idea and maybe the story or inspiration behind it come alive. Here, you also start to hone in on your value added product idea and a bit of a sales strategy. Helpful questions to answer include, what is your value added product idea? And what, would, what market form would your product have? Some options here are shelf stable, refrigerated, frozen, baked, canned, et cetera. For the herb product, um, I will be selling the dried herbs that are grown on my farm. And for the first product run, I'm considering oregano, thyme and red chili flakes. Dried herbs would be considered a, a shelf stable product. Next, think about what makes your product different or better than products that are already on the market. Is your product filling a, a gap in the market? Does this product align with your short-term and long-term goals? If so, how? We'll touch on the importance of business plans later in the presentation, but this could be a place to bring out your existing business plan. From the herb product, they would be locally produced with organic ingredients, and they would likely be fresher than dried herbs and spices that are found at lo large local grocery stores. And to my knowledge, there's not a local supplier of the dried organic herb products. And how does the product align with my business's short-term and long-term goals? I'm interested in starting to diversify my business through value-added products. And this seems like a product um, with low barriers to entry. So we'll see how that plays out throughout the process. So now that we've answered some fundamental questions about your value added product idea, we can move into the feasibility stage. Questions answered in this stage will inform your decision to proceed with the next steps or tell you to pause before spending more time and money on something that might not be feasible. The first step is to identify your target market. Who will buy the product? This could include an established customer base like existing farmer's market customers or new buyers who are interested in your product and agree to purchase a certain quantity. Next, how will your consumers benefit from it? What problem is it solving for them? This could be simple, like there's no locally made nut butter, or it could be more complex. Busy families in your communities need pre-made meals from your farm. For the target market of the local herb products would be consumers who care about purchasing local herbs and these consumers would be coming from the farmer's market, um, generally people who cook and people who might be shopping for gifts. And currently there's no local source for organic herbs and they will op the product that I'm thinking about offering will offer a fresher option to grocery store options. Next, identify who the competition is. How is your product different from theirs and what could you do better? You can typically find information about competitors by visiting places where products like yours are sold or online. I've identified a few competitors um, such as ones that are sold by my local food co-op that sells herbs in jars and in bulk and then Cadia Herbs which can be purchased online and Oaktown Spice Co which has retail locations in the Bay Area and products that can be purchased online. Another important consideration when identifying your competition is to think about how you will sell your product and look for competitors who will sell their products similarly. So for the herb product, there are many competitors to choose from, especially folks um, who sell through online channels. But I selected co competitors with a consumer facing business model because it's similar to the way that I will sell my herb products. Getting samples of other products could also help you identify how your product is different from others in the marketplace. 
And what do you do if there's nothing like your market, your product on the market? You can look at the next closest type of product for information about your competitors. For example, a flower farmer wanted to grow and sell dried flower wreath kits where all the flowers, supplies, and instructions were in the box for customers to assemble at home, but the flower farmer couldn't find another product like this on the market. So the best comparison that they chose from was already made dried flower wreaths from local farms. So as you research and identify your competitors, it's also a good practice to start gathering information about your competitors' prices in order to calculate the price per unit of weight and the median and average price among your competitors. This is really to get a standard price across competitors. For the herb product, I found that herb products are typically sold in ounces. So I calculated the price per ounce of each product and then calculated the median and average cost among the four competitors that I selected. So you can see here that um, there is some fluctuation among competitors of, regarding their price per ounce, but the median price is $8.94 per ounce and the average price is just under that at $8.68 per ounce. This step will help determine your pricing strategy later on. So let's continue. Next, identify a market or markets where you plan to sell your products. There's some different options to choose from and we've kind of tried to summarize the different options and benefits and some drawbacks of both or of all. Retail markets or direct to consumer markets typically provide the, heart, the highest margin for folks. Another benefit is that the product's reception at these outlets can also be a good indication of how the product will be received in a larger marketplace. Direct to consumer sales though can require more time and energy. For example, think about the time and energy that it takes to set up a farmer's market booth. Direct wholesale or selling directly to a retail market like local grocery stores typically provides the next best profit margin, though profits may depend on if you work with a broker and shelf space fees in these markets may also apply. Indirect, indirect wholesale typically offers the smallest profit margin for value added products and brokerage and shelf space fees may apply here as well, depending on who you work with. Partnership opportunities could be a reason to pursue this kind of market though. So for example, in this market channel, farmers could partner with institutions like companies or schools to give all of their employees the farmer's value added product as a holiday gift. And as I mentioned before, I'll start selling the herb products at my local farmer's market where my farm already has an established presence. Next, determine how you'll market your product. Here's where you start to, start to hone in on your marketing strategy. Will you rely on word of mouth or need to launch a social media marketing campaign about your product? Do you already have a strong brand presence and brand loyalty? If not, your marketing strategy will need to account for this. And because I already have an established brand presence at the farmer's market, I'm primarily going to rely on that as well as word of mouth among my consumers. And then we're curious to hear from you, what are some other ideas for marketing your value added product? Maybe something that has worked well or something that you're considering. If you wanna drop those ideas in the chat box, we'd love to hear them. And I guess an important note that I'm not exactly monitoring the chat box. So Kaylee, if anything comes through, just let me know, you can feel free to interrupt me. Okay, so after the answering the questions presented in the module so far, you should be able to start estimating some of your cost of goods sold, which are also known as COGS. Estimating COGS can also help identify costs that you haven't thought of yet. COGS include all of the costs and expenses directly related to the production of goods, so of your value added product. Indirect costs, such as business overhead, equipment, sales and marketing expenses are not included in COGS and we'll discuss them later in this webinar. 
There are certain things we need to establish before being able to determine your COGS though. The first is setting an initial production quantity, which can be determined by a limitation in raw commodity or a sales product projection. So you think you can sell this many units or grow this many pounds of herbs. The next is obtaining price estimates for any ingredients and packaging materials, including labels. And at this point, it's important to set a realistic production quantity and obtain price estimates based on the production quantity because prices can fluctuate based on how much of an ingredient or packaging you plan to purchase. So typically you can get a discount for purchasing bulk packaging or bulk labeling. We also need to estimate the amount of labor needed to produce the production quantity that we've estimated. Labor hours can be estimated based on how much time it takes to produce one batch of product multiplied by the number of batches you plan to produce. And next, you would compare that time to the total available time with your current staffing and assess whether you need to require, whether it will require new staffing or some type of equipment automation. Now we'll take a look at an example using some of these concepts using the herb products. So what are our COGS? So you'll see from the table, I set the initial production quantity by a sales project projection. I think that I can sell 200 units in one year. And to start, I estimate that I, my batches will be made in 50 unit increments. I do not need to purchase additional ingredients to meet this projection. Because the herbs will be packed and sold in ounces, the calculation of raw commodity per batch and farming the raw commodity are in ounces. But if you're dealing with larger volumes like pounds, you'll definitely need to adjust accordingly. You also might be asking why we separated the cost of farming from labor costs. The labor costs in COGS are typically just the production of the value added product. So we included farming costs, which could include seeds, irrigation and labor for the commodity as its own line item. And this allows us to um, put a value on the commodity and our time as farmers. For packaging costs per unit, I plan to purchase jars that hold about um, one and a quarter ounces at $1.75 each, and labels will cost an additional 50 cents each for a total of $2.25. To reach $3.40 per unit in labor costs, I estimated that one that producing one batch will take one staff person working six hours at $15 an hour and one staff person working four hours at $20 an hour. So you could imagine that most of the time would be spent by someone um, working, working on the farm or working on value added products specifically, and then one person who's more in a management role. And I estimated a low number of hours for processing time for this um, type of product specifically because dehydrating is a relatively hands-off process and involves letting the herbs sit while being able to complete other tasks. And I also determined that this product will not require additional staffing at this scale. So just keep in mind that the labor cost per unit here um, will likely be different than if you were doing this exercise for the product you're thinking of producing. So that gives us a total estimated COGS um, with farming costs to be $5.74 per unit. So using your COGS, you can now determine the price that you need to charge to make at least a 50% margin in both wholesale and retail markets. And why are we using a 50% margin as our target? Estimating COGS varies across scale. And so sticking with a 50% margin in both wholesale and retail markets is a good baseline without having to get into how much of your COGS should be devoted to labor, ingredients, or packaging. With my COGS per unit, I use the margin formula indicated on the slide to determine how much I need to charge for at least a 50% margin in both wholesale and retail markets. So about $12.50 in retail and then $11.50 in wholesale per unit. So per unit of product. Now it's time to start assessing our pricing strategy. 
So I started by calculating my price per ounce, and then it would be needed. It would need to be adjusted based on what other unit of um, unit of weight that your product would come in, and compare your price with the competitor price comparison that's also on this slide. So you'll see um, on this slide we estimate the price per ounce of the herb product to be $16.67. Um, and then we compare our price estimate to the competitor price comparison from earlier to determine if we can realistically charge this price. So you'll notice that the estimated price for my herb product is almost half the price of the median and average cost of my competitors. So now we can ask, um, can I realistically charge this price? Well, the activity shows that the dried herb product is definitely on the higher end of the price point scale. And in the real world, I would likely revisit my COGS and find ways to bring costs down. However, to illustrate the product development process, we're gonna continue to use this example as we go through the next section on product development. There are also some important things to think about in setting your pricing strategy, your price point can be used as key parts of your marketing message or branding. So if the price of your product sits among higher end products, it shows that your labeling and packaging needs a higher level of sophistication. And then if your product or the price of your product aligns with middle tier products, your packaging and labeling can be a little less sophisticated. So now Kaylee is going to walk us through some elements of the development part of the process, and then we will continue on um, together in just a bit. Kaylee, are you ready to go? Yeah, I had an audio switch. Can you hear me this, this way? Yeah, I can. Okay, great. I think thanks for folks chiming in in the chat box as Grace was just presenting that section. Um, I think we got most of the questions answered either by um, People, people that are the panelists today or some of our attendees also answered questions of other people or chimed in, so thanks. Um, but we'll keep monitoring that. And um, if there's something that doesn't get covered, remember there'll be questions and answer time at the end. So um, now kind of moving through this development process uh, schematic here, we're in the development stage and the development stage continues to address more complex issues and decisions decisions around product viability, like regulations, production, and financial considerations. Um, and just a quick disclaimer, this section in particular in this uh, presentation today, it's important to note that the examples given for dried herbs, and it's likely that another product would be more complicated. So just for kind of simplicity's sake here and uh, through time, just stay on track here in the webinar, we're using this dried herb example. But that's kind of like an example that falls into the most basic um, situation. So keep that in mind for your product. It might be a lot different. Um, so for development um, up first, it's likely that your value added product will be affected by food processing regulations. Uh, regulations are in place because processed foods inherently possess varying levels of food safety risk. And food processing is regulated by multiple entities, the federal government, individual states, counties, and cities. So it's really place dependent on where you're producing your product and selling it that to figure out like what specific um, regulations you need to be in compliance with. Um, since uh, CAF is a California-based organization, we are going to talk about California-based uh, regulations that affect food producers, including the cottage food law, the processed food registration permit, and the cannery license. Food products are also subject to product labeling requirements as well, and we'll touch on that. Um, but again, it, it, labeling is, you know, it's helpful to ground that in your unique example of how, what you need to do. So we'll, we'll give an overview. Um, and then we'll get into the details of each of these regulations as we go on the next few slides here. So first, the cottage food law allows people to prepare and or package certain low risk foods in a private home kitchen and can be the most cost effective option for starting a food processing business. Businesses must meet specific requirements stated by the California Health and Safety Code to be able to, to, to fall under this cottage food 
um, permits. So for example, you can only be preparing and packaging foods that are on the cottage food approved foods list. You need to complete a training and you must be implementing sanitary um, operating conditions. The cottage food law only applies to processed foods on the approved list. Um, I think Grace is dropping some um, links in the chat that link to that. Um, and your gross business revenue is capped at 75,000 for a class A operator um, cottage food license. And, and those are people that sell directly to the public like at a farmer's market booth or 150,000 for a class B operator um, cottage food license, which is somebody selling directly to the public um, and or indirectly to restaurants and food markets. Uh, right now, there's currently 32 approved foods for in-home production on the California cottage food list. And you, there is a way that you can like um, submit a, a new food that is not on the list that you want them to consider potentially adding to the list as well. So that's the cottage food um, permit, uh, the initial details for it. Um, but then some more details related to it is that the cottage food permit process is county to county. So we're talking about it um, kind of in a broad uh, summary right now, but you need to register your business, business as a cottage food operation with your local county environmental health department. So each county in California has their own slightly different ways that they do this. So you, it's best to just check um, with them and um, they'll have the form you need to fill out and they will be the one who would um, check the kitchen and whatnot. So if your product or business does not meet the pretty narrow requirements for the cottage food law, it's likely that your product may meet the California Processed Food Registration or PFR permit um, requirements because the PFR permit is for food businesses to produce and manufacture food products um, in California that are considered low risk. For example, like refrigerated products, olive oil, traditionally fermented products like kimchi or kombucha. Um, the permitting process process for a PFR is more onerous than a cottage food permit because the food safety risks are greater um, and it's a multi-step process to get a PFR. So first you would submit the PFR application with the California Department of Public Health Food and Drug Branch and then pay the application fees. After that the Food and Drug Branch should contact you once your application is processed but this can take months to acquire and might require follow-up. It's recommended that a business submit that an application for a PFR permit at least 60 days before you want to start manufacturing or warehousing or storing food products. After your PFR application is approved, you will be contacted to schedule a pre-registration facility inspection of your business to ensure you're in compliance with the California Health and Safety Code, good manufacturing practices, PASSUP, um, HACCP, hazard analysis and critical control points requirements for certain products might be applicable and food labeling requirements. Um, so this would be like an inspection at the kitchen where you are making the product or if, you, if you're storing products somewhere at that physical location. Um, so if you're like renting space at a commercial kitchen, it would be there. Um, if you store foods in a separate location from where they are produced, then you would, that storage area would also need their, its own PFR. Um, so we're going to move on to the third type of regulatory um, permit for in California, which is the cannery license. Um, and I know there's been, I've been seeing things pop up in the chat, but I haven't been looking at them. So um, Grace, feel free to interrupt me if there's something time sensitive. Um, but for now, the cannery license is the most complex permit um, for food safety requirements in California. And it is needed if you're going to produce and man manufacture low acid and acidified canned foods, such as canned vegetables, canned salsa, non-fermented hot sauce. Um, there's lots of other examples. The cannery license has the most requirements for food producers based on the risk of consuming improperly processed low acid and acidified canned foods 
which can lead to severe health consequences, um, botulism and others, which can cause death. So these are the most risky products and therefore the highest amount of oversight. Um, so how do you get a cannery license? There are several requirements before a cannery operation can obtain the license. First, all the products and processes must be evaluated by the University of California Lab for Research and Food Preservation for botulism risk prior to the initial production. Um, the lab works with you to basically validate the process that you use to create the product, that it will have a certain pH, it will have a certain water activity, and the product needs to meet those parameters and, and others, and you need to produce it according to the specific um, instructions or recipe that you share with them. So the canneries must comply with these specific regulatory requirements, and then you submit a pre-licensing facility inspection of your facility. So um, you'll be inspected, and then as you continue to operate with a cannery license, the California Department of Public Health Food and Drug Branch cannery inspector must inspect each lot or batch of product after it is produced before it is released onto the market for sale. Um, so there's, a, there's some timing there of like, you, even though you have finished product, you're not gonna be able to sell it until it's inspected and uh, released for sale. Uh, so as you might imagine, obtaining a, a cannery license is a multi-step process. First, you send the product to the UC lab um, to determine if you do indeed need the cannery license because of whatever the pH may be or the level of water activity. If the lab results determine that the cannery license is required, then you would go through the application process with the California Department of uh, Public Health, Food and Drug Branch and pay the application fees. After the application approval and fee processing, there's the pre-licensing inspection. Um, and then once the cannery successfully completes the inspection, the cannery license would be mailed to the um, business. And cannery licenses are valid for two years, and you should expect the process to take three to four months. Um, so that was a lot of somewhat complicated information. So here's a little bit of a visual overview of kind of from left to right, the cottage food regulations, are the least um, complicated to comply with, but they also are the narrower in what foods you can make or what products you can make under them. Um, and the process food registration permit is more in the middle and the cannery license is um, the most complicated, but also um, for highest risk foods. So for, for safety reasons, it, that is um, necessary. Okay, so at this point, um, hopefully you're feeling a little bit more knowledgeable about the food safety regulations required of many value added product types, um, and you can determine which regulations you will need to follow for your product. Um, you might also be glad to hear that there are maybe some food based and non food based value added products that do not require permits or license. For example, some food based products um, that do not require permits could be creating a salsa making kit from farm fresh produce where all the produce you know stays whole and fresh and raw but you like package it together as like a kit with maybe some instructions um, if you're selling fresh herbs and branded clamshells um, that is a value added product but wouldn't need any permitting some examples of some non-food value added products that do not require permits could be soaps or balms um, body products dog food treats, wool, um, different products such as those. So as I mentioned earlier in this section, value-added products are also subject to labeling requirements, and those are regulated at the federal level by the FDA. Um, so for value-added products, you must include on their label the product name, the net weight, the name of the manufacturer, packer, or distributor, the place of the business, so like the physical address and the ingredient list. And then include an allergen statement if your product contains one of the eight major FDA food allergens. 
the label and font size requirements also apply and any claims that you might wanna make on your label like gluten-free or sugar-free would require additional information. Um, so keep that in mind if you um, are thinking about doing that. And then um, an important note to make about labeling is that there's a small business nutrition labeling exemption that exempts small businesses from including nutrition labels on their products. Um, but to be able to claim this exemption, the business must have fewer than an average of 100 full-time equivalent employees and sell fewer than 100,000 units of a product over a 12-month period. So if you would qualify for that with selling less than 100,000 units in a year and having less than 100 full-time equivalent employees, you could submit a small business nutrition labeling exemption form. So we've just skimmed the surface of food labeling requirements. Um, so we encourage you to learn more about labeling through the resources mentioned on this slide, and these will be included and sent to attendees after um, the presentation today. We just don't want to take too much time going over labeling details because um, if you, it's different from product to product and to some extent, and each person's um, situation might be a little different. So um, we're gonna keep going. So thanks, Kaylee. Yeah. Um, I think that's it, right? Uh, yeah, we can switch here. Okay. Um, or no, it's not. Sorry, it's not. You <laughs> I thought this is a natural breaking point. You should keep going. Okay. Yeah, I think I have just a couple of slides. Um, so let's put the regulations into action through the dried herb um, product example. Uh, Dried herbs are on the California cottage food approved list. They're one of those 32 product, um, foods that are on there. So that means that Grace in her example, she can produce those dried herbs in her home kitchen as long as she receives a permit and her annual gross revenues fall within the 75,000 to 150,000 range, depending upon where she's selling the product. Um, so Grace lives in Tuolumne County, so she would need to contact the cottage food operation or the environmental health department in Tuolumne County and apply for the cottage food registration permit. They have an online form um, and she would submit it um, to get, and then also get a copy of her food handler card. So that's like a kind of food safety verification that goes along with it. Um, so the California food handler card requirement involves passing a test that is de designed to ensure that restaurant employees receive a reasonable level of training and food safety practices to reduce the potential for foodborne illness. So Grace would make sure she's following the correct product labeling requirements and the registration form um, for the cottage food permit also includes product labeling requirements and requires a submission of the sample label. So making dried herbs and doing those in her home kitchen, selling them at the farmer's market um, would all fit under the um, cottage food allowable activities. So the permitting cost will not only depend on the type of permit or license you are going to need to pursue for your value added product idea or product, um, but also the location where you plan to con conduct and obtain the, the permit. Um, so the California food handler course and exam can be taken online and state law keeps that course affordable at around $15. And the, the PFR and the cottage or the cottage food permit and the cannery license, um, it's hard to give you know estimates of cost for those because it's based on hourly rates of things and initial paperwork, you know, turning those in. So um, that we can get into more details of those or you can check the resources on that. Now back to you, Grace. Thanks so much, Kaylee. So there were some questions in the chat and I think we got to most of them. And just as a reminder, I'm dropping these links into the chat, but those links will go away once we end the webinar. And so you'll all receive a copy of this presentation, a PDF copy where you'll be able to access the links 
after the presentation, after the webinar. And then there was some were some questions about poultry products like bone broth and salt cured quail eggs. And the salt cured quail eggs, um, I believe, are going to involve a separate set of regulations. And I'm looking into this a bit more um, and can follow up with you, Katrina, after the webinar, unless maybe Ellen knows off the top of her head. I'm not sure, Ellen, if you know or want to unmute yourself. And then I don't know, Ellen, if you know about bone broth either. Oops, sorry. Hi, yeah. So um, eggs would end up going under the USDA, which is a little more complicated than the FDA, not impossible. You're definitely looking at being in a professional kitchen space, not doing something in your home, um, having either built out a commercial kitchen on your farm or working within one. Um, and a lot of the actual requirements are the same. The labeling is slightly different because the USDA has their own uh, labeling regulations and the USDA for all products that go through the USDA, you do have to have a HACCP plan, which typically it's recommended that you do that professionally rather than try to create one yourself. Cause it's just has more, there's more, um, specificity around food safety. There's more things to be conscious of when it comes to the food safety parts. Um, bone broth, I feel like that's something that we could look at and get back to people. There is Broths typically also go under the USDA. Um, I know recently I was working with a client though, and there was a certain, it, there was a little bit of an asterisk on whether that product would have gone to the USDA and the FDA. And I don't remember that detail off the top of my head. So I feel like that's a good one to follow up on. Awesome. Thanks, Ellen. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think, um, I was anticipating us getting questions that we might not be able to answer in real time because they do take additional research on our end, but I can take note of the questions that we can't answer and then we can follow up to everyone in the follow-up email with more information about those. So definitely keep your questions coming even if we might not be able to give you a definitive answer today. Okay, so let's keep going in the, um, in the presentation. So after thinking through and figuring out what our regulatory requirements are, we can start to shift into how we're gonna produce our products. We'll spend on the next couple of slides, some time discussing questions to answer related to processing requirements for your product. So the categories that we have on this slide can be helpful for thinking about how batch size will impact the cost of ingredients or your packaging, equipment, and your processing requirements. Low volume is thought of as less than 40 pounds per run, which is the equivalent to five gallons. Food service volume is 50 to 150 pounds per run or 10 to 25 gallons. And food processing volume is more than 200 pounds per run, also um, the equivalent of 25 gallons. So for my dry, dried herb products, they're typically sold direct to consumer in small quantities. So I will definitely start by producing and packaging less than 40 pounds per run. So next, you should get clear on the ingredients needed for your product. Um, do you produce all of the ingredients? And if not, which ingredients do you need to purchase? And who do you plan on purchasing those ingredients from? For the dried herb products, I currently grow the herbs at my farm and will continue production there and don't plan on purchasing ingredients from an outside supplier as of yet. So now that you've figured out your production quantity and ingredient requirements, we'll, we can discuss how to process and pack your product. There are several options for where to process and pack your value added product, but as we just learned, your decision will need to depend on the regulations affecting your product, also your batch size and any labor constraints that you might have. If you are eligible for the cottage food law, you might consider processing and packaging your product in your home kitchen. But if your product requires a PFR or a cottage food license, you can still do processing and packing yourself, but you'll need to do it in a commercial kitchen. Types of do-it-yourself operations are typically recommended for low volume product runs rather than um, 
the other two types of, of runs that we just learned about. With the cottage food um, permit that is required with the herbs, the herb products and current production plan of 50 units, the herbs will be produced in house. And then um, renting a commercial kitchen is another option that can provide a location for small scale food entrepreneurs to safely and legally process food. Commercial kitchens can be ideal for low volume, food service volume, and food processing volume product runs. And commercial kitchen rentals are also a good option because they can still keep startup costs low. Um, if you've maybe looked into renting a commercial kitchen in your area and haven't had much luck, um, local restaurants might also rent out commercial kitchen space when they're not in production. So that could be an avenue to look into. And then building your own on-farm commercial kitchen is also an option, but it's not very common because of the high startup costs. And we've also heard some anecdotal evidence that the investment um, that you make in building a commercial kitchen on your farm may not recoup the actual cost of the building. And we've also heard that some county health departments have reduced some requirements for on-farm kitchens. Um, which can be more cost effective than building a proper commercial kitchen, but you should check your um, with your county health department about their requirements because this is a county level um, regulation and not something that we can kind of um, generalize across the state or across the country, unfortunately. And another option is for your operation to work with a co-packer. Um, co-packers manufacture and package food for other businesses um, to sell, and they also provide entrepreneurs with a variety of services in addition to manufacturing and packaging products. As I mentioned, we'll hear from Marilee Olson from Preserve Farm Kitchens, which is a business in Sonoma County that offers this type of co-packing service. Um, and then one thing to consider when working with co-packers and selecting the right one for your operation some co-packers will not use your ingredients if they want to buy all ingredients from a wholesale market, um, which could be a major deal breaker if you're a farmer wanting to use your crops. And then also, as we'll get into, if you're a farmer and you want to apply for the value added producer grant. So on this slide, we have some tips for working with a co-packer. Um, databases exist to help you find a dedicated co-packer. And then also keep in mind that per low production minimums typically start at around 1,000 units. Another option for processing and production could be to work with a small producer in your area who's already producing a similar product who could potentially act as your co-packer. And then we have a number of resources and links here that we'll drop into the chat and that you'll have access to after the presentation regarding working with a co-packer. So next, you'll assess your facility requirements and costs. And keep in mind that facility requirements go just beyond production space and include storage for ingredients, storage for packaging, and storage for the final product. So think about if you need to rent a storage space or if it, maybe it's included in your commercial kitchen rental. Can you use your own home or farm as a storage facility? For my herb products, I will produce these in my home kitchen. And then for now, I also plan to store these items in my home. I have a spare room in my house to store some packaging, final products, and boxes. Next, think about what your equipment requirements are. Do you already own equipment that can be used for this new value-added product? or do you need to purchase new equipment based on the processing and packing of your product? I currently, my current practice for drying my herbs is to let them hang dry over seven to 10 days, but I definitely need a commercial dehydrator to speed up the process and make a market, marketable quantity. So I found a commercial dehydrator that I think will help me do this for about $950. And then I also need um, a commercial grade sieve to separate the leaves from this, uh, their stems. And I found one online that looks like a good option for about $28. Distribution of your final, pr of your product is another important consideration in this stage. So think about how you'll distribute the final product, if you'll do it by car or by mail. 
a fellow farmer on um, a distribution route already, another value added producer, distributor or broker? And are there any costs associated with these options? Um, I plan just to start by distributing the herb products by truck to the farmer's market. And I already have a vehicle, so I don't need to purchase an additional one for the value added product. Additionally, um, what frequency will you deliver your product or have it available? Is it weekly, seasonal, or year round? The farmer's market where I plan to sell is seasonal. So my sales will be focused seasonally at first, but if sales go well uh, for the herb product, I might consider offering them year round. So after determining um, feasibility or regulatory requirements and processing and production plans for your value added product, um, writing a business plan and a marketing plan can also help assess your business success Ensure that your profit will cover your operating expenses like marketing, distribution, permit costs, equipment, and help determine your startup investment and if you need any additional funding. Um, and for folks who are new to value added products for the first time, marketing process products can be entirely different from selling raw commodities, um, which is another good reason um, to think about updating or creating a new marketing plan for your value added product. We're not really gonna get into writing a business plan um, in this webinar series, but we do have some resources for you and we will drop those in the chat and then you'll also have them as a resource after the webinar. So finally, we are gonna total up all of the operating costs that we've identified throughout the state, the development stage. So our permitting costs, um, the equipment, a commercial dehydrator, a sieve. And then I've also added some marketing costs to increase um, and add new signage related to the herb products for the farmer's market. And then also there are some costs associated with producing this product like harvest clippers. And I didn't include them here because they're already associated with the farm. Now that we've estimated our product price, our COGS, our total units and operating expenses, we can try to estimate the total profit for year one. Um, so as you can see, I've taken um, the price, the cost of goods sold per unit, the total units that I expect to sell in year one, and that's given me a profit of around $1,350. And then I subtract the total operating expenses to get my, um, my net income, which is about $114. So to me, this seems um, not very significant and um, probably another red flag that I should go back to my COGS and find ways to bring my costs down. But for the purposes of this exercise and the webinar, we're gonna proceed to the next step and assess if scaling up production um, would help bring up the net income for this product. So I know you've um, you all probably been sitting down for um, just over an hour now, we wanna give you all about a five minute break, and then we're gonna come back and wrap up the rest of this presentation, hear from Mary Lee, and then have our question and answer session. So if you all will come back around 12.07 Pacific time, um, we will get started. And then we'll try to answer some questions in the meantime during the break. So we'll see you back here in about five minutes.
All right, folks, welcome back. Start returning to your computers if you haven't already. And we are gonna finish out this portion of the presentation. All right, so we're nearing the end, um, but we still have a couple of stages left of the development cycle. So the next one up is to run a small batch test run of your product. After assessing feasibility and deciding that it is indeed time to move forward, let's do a small batch test run of your product. If this is your first product or a new product with some uncertainties still left to work out, um, we recommend keeping costs at a minimum to the, at the beginning. And this can be done by producing a small batch first um, and then processing at an existing facility instead of investing in expensive equipment. During the test run, select a test market um, is an important decision and consider testing your product directly with consumers where you could solicit their feedback about the product, packaging, label, price, um, easily. As your product is on the market for the first time, develop a system for tracking your sales and collect data about your customers, customer base and sales revenues. So this part about collecting data about consumer behavior related to your product could be the most important step in this process. So keep track of how much you how much product you sell each week, if some markets seem more profitable than others, and whether outside factors seem to affect sales consistency. And then use this data to help inform your next steps and if anything needs to change as you scale up. Some questions to get you started are how is your product received by consumers? How is your label received by consumers? How is your packaging size received by consumers? And how is your price received by consumers? After your test run is complete, we can follow one of two paths. So you'll see demonstrated in the schematic on this slide with different arrows. Um, you can return to the feasibility stage or proceed to the scaling stage. So if customers gave feedback or your product didn't sell well during the test run, you might not go the scaling route initially. You might realize that you need to change your product in some way and return to refining the execution of your idea in the feasibility stage. But if your small batch test run did go well, let's explore scaling your product into a, the marketplace as you originally estimated. So as you can see, there are two things that could be happening um, in, the, in scaling from test run to scale. Um, your, this would be if your initial batch test run went well and you want to produce your product according to your initial production plan. And then if you're going from scaling to feasibility, this is if you're producing at one level that may or may not be working. And now you want to go through the process to see how scaling would impact costs, production, and regulations. So for example, if you wanted to shift from a cottage operation to a rented kitchen. Grace, can I interrupt real quick? Um, yeah. Are you able to make Ellen a co-host so she can respond to, her, her, to the chat box as well? Yeah. Wouldn't give me that option. Okay, Ellen. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so the scaling stage is time to revisit some of the questions that we went through earlier to assess your needs to scale up production. Do you need to increase your batch size to meet consumer demand or increase profitability related to your batch size? Can your product be produced commercially in the same way it's produced in small quantities? Scaling from a one gallon quality, quantity made in your home kitchen into a 20 gallon batch made in a commercial kitchen will likely involve some level of recipe development. Um, and recipe development is typically a service that's offered by third parties like a co-packer. Also, what changes need to be made based on the results from your test run? Did you receive consumer feedback about product sizes, labels, or packaging? You can use consumer feedback to inform any changes here. And then where will your product be produced? Are you maxing out your home kitchen in your um, small batch test run and realize you need to research commercial kitchen spaces to rent in order to scale up? 
Now is when you would affirm or revisit any production needs. Similarly, do you need to make any additional investments in facilities, equipment, and personnel in order to scale up and increase profitability? So applying these questions to my herb product, since my initial calculations showed that I needed to sell my herb products at $12.50 per unit to secure at least a 50% margin, and that the price per ounce of that product is too high for the market, I'm interested in comparing the calculations with batch sizes of 200 and 500 units. So now we can calculate and compare the cost of goods sold across scales, which can, um, as we know, will allow us to calculate our gross profit margin later on. So again, keep in mind that costs will differ depending on scale. So for example, bulk purchase of packaging might reduce costs while larger batches of products could also necessitate additional um, equipment expenses. And in order to estimate costs across scale, you might need to call or email suppliers for their price lists. In this example, let's pretend that I have the raw commodity to produce up to 500 units of product and that my costs of farming the raw commodity remain the same across scales. Even at 500 units, um, I'm still not eligible for any bulk packaging rates by my supplier. And so that means that the only costs that change in any of these three scenarios are gonna be my labor costs. So as you can see, preparing 500 units in one batch um, reduces the, my cost of goods sold by, um, by more than half, but there isn't much of a difference between the costs of producing 200 units um, versus 500 units. And we also need to revisit the pricing strategy by first determining our price to end up with a 50% margin. So when compared to the price of $12.50 per unit for a 50 unit batch, the price per unit of a 200 unit batch is lower and the price per unit for 50, 500 unit batch is almost halved in comparison to the $12.50 price that we set for the 50 unit batch. So we then use our new prices to determine our price per ounce across scales, which is something that we did earlier, but just applying it to the 200 unit and 500 unit batches and then compare it to our original competitor price comparison. So as you can see with increasing the batch size of 200 or 500 units, the price per ounce is more aligned with the median and average cost of my competitors compared to the other options. Um, scaling could also require additional investments in operating expenses. So here are some considerations as you estimate additional or increased operating expenses distribution, like working with a distributor or purchasing an additional vehicle. Equipment upgrades could also be needed. And if you're planning to produce more product, that means you need to sell more product. So your marketing plan and supplies would need to reflect updated sales goals. So for the herb product, I've decided that I need to purchase an additional commercial dehydrator to process the 500 unit volume of herbs and that will increase my development related costs to um, just over $2,000. So finally, it's time to calculate um, our estimated profit margin um, across scales and decide where to go next. So here we can answer the question, how much would my business profit if I processed batches at 500 units of dried herbs versus 200 or 500? So this comparison tells me that even though producing 200 units decreases my COGS and my price per unit, which would be likely attractive to my audience, the loss in profit results in negative net income here. And then similarly, producing 500 units decreases my estimated COGS and my price per ounce, but increases my operating expenses to a point that is also not profitable. And I do need to keep in mind though that my operating expenses likely will not continue to be this high year after year because I won't need to purchase two dehydrators every single year. So this tells me that I need to think about the term profitability um, before proceeding. 
For folks who um, are not using this herb example as your product, um, at this point with the data about the price um, your consumers are willing to pay, which can come from your small batch test run, information about your markets and COGS for scaling up production, you should affirm or your original price or set a new price and scale production if that's the direction that you decide to pursue. The dried herb products, um, as you can see, definitely need to go back to the drawing board on this one and that's okay. I think it's better that we figured it out here before investing more time and money in trying to make this work. So congratulations, we've successfully completed the value added product development process. As a reminder, this is an iterative process and we've included many questions and considerations for farmers interested in launching a value added product to consider throughout their process. And as a reminder, this webinar is, was meant to provide an overview of the questions and activities to conduct as part of the product development process, knowing that it doesn't look the same for everyone and there are likely parts um, that were not included that you might run into. So that said, we recognize that this information was you know, presented briefly and rather quickly. And so we've developed a worksheet to accompany this presentation that distills the main points and has um, some formulas for you all to take home and use um, in hopes that you might not have to go through every slide of the presentation to get the meaningful information that you need to decide whether to pursue a value added product. So we'll follow up with that worksheet after the presentation via email. So now we'll shift into hearing from Marilee Olson from Preserve Farm Kitchens. Um, I see there are some messages in the chat. I don't know, Kaylee, if we need to get into any of those right now or if we should just go into um, Marilee's presentation. I think we're good. Um, Alan was just catching up on some earlier questions and um, yeah, we're good for now. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. So I'm going to um, switch presentations here. So just give me a moment. Okay. Um, I don't, do you all see this in uh, presenter format with the notes? Yeah, we see the, like the slides along the bottom and yeah, the other notes. Okay. Let's see, okay. There you go, looks good. Is that it? Yep, we just see okay. the slide. Marilee, you are still on mute. Do you want me to unmute you? Uh, yep, I'm good. Yeah. Go. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, what a fantastic presentation that was, Grace, uh, Kaylee, and and Ellen. Um, I wish I'd had that before I started my business. <laughs> as a co-packer 12 years ago. So I'm Marilee Olson with Preserve Farm Kitchens. Um, I did start this business 12 years ago. I, I founded um, my company in order to help farmers preserve their harvest and create value-added products. It was specifically for this. And before I started it, I, I sort of researched how many companies there were like mine or like my idea in the United States. And I only came up with a very tiny handful. And it's really interesting that 12 years later, there's much more than a handful. So the need has been uh, seen and, and to a certain degree addressed. So that's, that's great news. Um, I've learned a lot in those 12 years, probably not enough, <laughs> but everything that I've learned is pretty specific to food in jars. So um, before I begin, if you would, and you've got anything specific to, that you'd like me to address, 
uh, that wasn't addressed in that comprehensive um, presentation so far, um, put that in the chat and and I'll try to take a look at that and um, and and address those questions. And there, I think there's also a question and answer after the, the whole presentation for everybody, right? Yeah. So um, next slide, please, Grace. Am I, am I, oh, there you go. Um, so I, I, I think this is repeating information that you all already know. Um, you know, these are these these are kind of tough numbers, right? When you're a small farm trying to actually make a living from farming. Um, we did a an impact report uh, without the 20 to 25 farmers that we work with. We did one in 2020 and one in 2021. Um, both of them compiled and researched and written by the fabulous Ellen Raleigh, who you'll hear a lot more from later. Um, and, and you can download that impact report as well if you can put that link up. 100% um, of our respondents reported that value-added products make a difference in their, in their farm income. And that value-added products are worth the effort of making them. That's a pretty substantial statement because it's a lot of effort as you just heard um, in the previous presentation. Um, but those who do it and stick with it and are willing to refine as they go along um, have had some real successes. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about, you know, our process. Um, our process as a co-packer, farmers bring their produce to us. We have a pretty small production kitchen as co-packers go. Um, a typical co-packer might have a 10 to 50,000 square foot space. Ours is about 4,000 square feet, and that includes storage. So when I dreamed this up, I thought we need agile right size kitchens so that we can keep minimums low and, and be able to take care of, of what farms send us. Um, we make food in jars only. That's Those are hot, uh, hot, they're cooked and they're hot filled into jars, making them shelf stable. And then the farmer comes back and picks those up and sells them either through their CSA or their farm stand or and some through some local retailers. Uh, they the, the process looks pretty simple, but it's not necessarily easy, particularly for the farms who have to, in the middle of harvest, get that produce to us and then come back and pick up that product. So um, while we do the, the incredibly laborious part of it, which is receiving the produce, cleaning it, prepping it, cooking it, the farmer still has to provide that transportation. And, and that's a pretty big impact for them. Um, I don't have a map of how far we how far our range is in terms of working with farmers, but it's from we've worked with farmers as far south um, a few years ago as San Luis Obispo and as far north as Willits. Um, so I think last year we covered about seven counties. Um, again, back to that import impact report. The reason farmers are willing to do this, they report, is that customer satisfaction goes way, way up, um, their brand visibility goes way, way up, and their income and cash flow is positively impacted. And that's important when you think about selling a value-added product in the off-season. So let's go to the next slide. This is a snapshot of my kitchen, our kitchen where we are, sort of some of the equipment, that the, uh, all of the equipment that we have and costs. 
when I started this some years ago, I was I was on a panel with a farmer who built out his own kitchen. And he stood up and he said he'd never recover the cost of investment to build out his own kitchen. Um, and I stood up and said, well, farmers, you don't need to because that's why we're here. 10 years later, I think that the real answer to this is to establish, and this is a um, my bold opinion on the subject, I, I think that the real answer is co-op type community kitchens in each county. Um, I think that if we were able to to put those kinds of kitchens in place, it could go a great, great way towards um, making a great many more value-added products from on-farm produce and thereby reducing food waste and all the good things that we know that that, that does. So my kitchen has steam, steam, two steam kettles. One is 100 gallons, one is 65 gallons, and we also have a... Uh, it's about a 30 gallon skillet. We've got some chopping and dicing equipment. We have a large flume washer that is able to wash all produce that comes in using acetic acid and making it very, very safe. Um, we have a semi-automatic filling line. Um, but the build out expenses for this kitchen, um, which was pre-existing to a degree, we're about $100,000. That was just the build out for it. With this kitchen, um, that number is wrong. We don't quite get to 300 cases a day. We can get on some products to 200 cases a day, which is very small in the co-packing world, in the traditional co-packing world. We only work with fruits and vegetables and uh, we are CCOF certified. I had an ambition to get non-GMO certification, but we never got there. We also do a very limited number of, of refrigerated products. So next slide, please. Some of the hurdles, um, these were all addressed in the previous presentation. You know, your product formulation, regulations and food safety, insurance. I didn't see anything on insurance come up, but it probably was there. Marketing skills and financing. In order to launch a successful value-added product line, these all must be addressed. And I will say from my own experience running a co-packing business, <laughs> probably the most critical of these are the sales and marketing skills. Because there's a, there's a truism in the industry. It's easy to get on the shelf or on your farmer's market table or on your farm stand or on a website. It's much more difficult to get that product off the shelf. And that's where your marketing skills come in. Um, uh, additional operational infrastructure, trucks if you don't have them, um, storage. I, I was just talking to Joe Shermer from Dirty Girl Produce this morning and um, this was really encouraging. I loved this. He's, you know, he's a farmer. He's got three properties, I think. He doesn't have a great space to hold the products that we make for him. And I think last year we made well over 500 cases of products for him. Watsonville Produce stores it for him. They come and pick it up for him and they store it for him. So again, I just want to, you know, when I think about the future of value-added production for farms, I think about, you know, how can consortiums be built that, that, that spread out the financial considerations um, quite a bit. Um, there are great resources available, not the, the least of which is the value-added producer grant, which Ellen will cover in detail. Uh, next time around, but these are these are things to you know certainly consider. So next slide, please, Grace. Here's here's I don't know how many of you have heard of John Eichard, who wrote a great many books. Um, he's a visionary economist and and author, 
And a number of years ago, he was the keynote speaker at EcoFarm. And he said this, your uniqueness is the only source of profitability that can't be competed away and thus is the only source of sustainable profits. So when you think about making value-added products, think about what you love, what you love and how you can how you can put your unique signature on that product. Um, as a co-packer, we make a lot of basically crushed tomatoes for tomato farms. Tomatoes are the number one product we work with. And it's really interesting because we make tomatoes from Sonoma County farms, from um, down in Hollister, and from over in Yolo County. And all of those taste quite different, of course, because of the terroir. We're not doing anything to it but adding salt. So, um, so whatever way you can express your uniqueness is going to be the avenue to success for you. Some of the other um, more unique products that we've made for farms, Boonville Barn Collective um, grows the um, Piment de Ville chili and grinds it themselves and sells a whole lot of different chili combinations dried. But we combined that with um, strawberries this year and it was just phenomenal. Um, Another farm sells a pizza kit. So it's a it's a small jar of a thicker sort of marinara sauce so that people can use that to make pizzas at home. Um, there are some functional products like elderberry blueberry preserves um, that can uh, tout some some real benefits. Um, so I, I really encourage you to think about what you want to do that will be unique and and speak volumes to who you are as a farm and a farmer. Next slide, please. So following up on this, oops, I made a this is this is about a, just a little bit more sort of philosophically or about value. Um, there's there there's capturing value and there's creating value. Capturing value is the nuts and bolts that that Grace and Kaylee went through in the previous presentation that is critical. It's critical to understand um, how you're actually going to capture value. What's your processing going to be? How are you going to get more of that food dollar? What's your marketing about? But then there's creating value. And this goes back to, to John's John Eichard's statement. What are the unique products or services? What are the real or perceived attributes of that product or service? And what's your story? What's your brand? Um, how does that uh, how does that fit in to what you are trying to establish? Um, I really uh, encourage you to think about think about those things. And I haven't met a farmer yet who isn't unique in some way. So. Um, I hope that you'll do that. Uh, next slide, please. This is a little different um, income scenario than the one Grace presented. Uh, and it has more to do with sort of um, opportunity. Um, opportunity. So price per pound. This is These are on average the price per pound that the farms that I have worked with for the last two to three years have charged if they were to sell their fresh produce, you know, somewhere in that category. Then there's cost of goods, which is um, labor, ingredients, packaging, and our co-packer fee. So you see that goes up quite a bit. Um, and these are these are per unit costs, right? Sale prices. I mean, the, the sale price is what the market will bear, and there's a range. Um, we've done strawberry preserves for people that sold them for only six dollars, and they're paying us four dollars a jar. So I think they're bar barely breaking even. Um, and then your profit per unit. 
can be anywhere from two to five dollars for dry farm tomatoes, two to seven for apricots, or two fifty to six fifty. All of those being higher than the price per pound realized by selling that product fresh. And then keeping in mind that for the most part, when you work with a co-packer or, or, or should you build out your own kitchens and, and make your own, you don't need to use your premium produce. You use your bee quality, you use your imperfect. Um, you want maximum flavor, certainly, but it does not need to be as pretty as that, which you put in a beautiful little pint and sell at the farmer's market. So in, in pretty much every case, value-added products have the potential to return more cash to you, especially in the off season. Um, I don't have, one of the things that I've I've always wished I had more information on. I don't know what the farming costs are. So the asterisks up there on price per pound are just the farmer's sale price. Um, they don't necessarily, none of this reflects what their farming cost is. And that is all I have, sweet and short and um Thank you all so much. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be with the professionals on this call who have been working so hard to deliver um, this fantastic information to you. So thank you. Thank you questions. so much, Marilee. We are going to do a couple of things before we get to questions, um, but I do wanna thank you. I think that presentation um, complemented ours really well and highlighting some other aspects of value-added products that are important for farmers to consider. Um, I am just going to share my screen and reshare my screen and then we'll get to question and answer in just a few moments. Okay, so uh, we've been sharing additional resources throughout this presentation, and these are some final resources to share um, that can kind of help direct you at a higher level with some, um, I guess, yeah, tasks or, or information related to value-added products. We have a couple of CAP resources. Um, just wanna call out the Small Farm Tech Hub could offer support with marketing, online sales and e-commerce at no cost to farmers. That could be something um, to take advantage of if you do have value-added products and are thinking about entering into the e-commerce space. Great, and I then, dropped those links into the chat, but we can't see your screen if you're, if you're sharing something right now. Oh, you can't? No, we see you. Okay. Okay. Maybe I forgot to do that. <laughs> Let's see. I think I did do. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Give me one moment. Okay, how about now? Can you see my screen? Go. Yep. Thank you. Good. Okay. So yeah, so just a few more resources to add to the pile. Um, Kaylee, drop them in the chat and then you'll also get them as um, follow-up, but the CAF Small Farm Tech Hub, the last bullet point here is the one that I mentioned that can help folks get help with online sales and e-commerce and marketing. And then before we get into questions, we do want to make time um, to get your important feedback about this webinar. And so we have a poll that we're going to launch in hopes that that can help us get a higher response rate. Um, so it looks like Kaylee just launched that. And we really appreciate you um, answering these questions. Honestly, it really helps us improve our programming. We will offer this webinar series next year. Um, and it helps demonstrate the value of 
series like they like these and keep the grant funds coming. So take just a few minutes, um, maybe a, just two minutes or so to answer those questions. And then we also have a separate evaluation form if you want to add any qualitative feedback because um, the poll question doesn't allow for that. So we'll drop a link to that form and we do appreciate any additional feedback you have for us through that um, Google form. All right, so we're going to give folks a little bit more time. If you haven't already submitted, um, please just try to take a few moments to answer these five questions and then we'll move on to question and answer. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Thanks all for your feedback. And then, yeah, don't forget about that additional evaluation um, form that was in the chat if you want to add anything, um, any written feedback as well. Okay, so now we are on to the question and answer portion. We have about 15 minutes um, for the Q&A session. And so I want to invite um, our speakers and um, contributors, Ellen and Marilee and Kaylee, to join us um, on video if you're able to help answer some of these questions. I appreciate you all answering them as we've gone on. I see a few more in the chat and the Q&A, and so I just want to maybe get to those. And then if there's any like high-level questions or high-level answers to provide um, as kind of a wrap-up, then we can do that. I see that Katrina has a question in the Q&A. What's a good profit margin for a small home business should aim to achieve? And ideally, how long should you make that profit margin before changes be considered? Um, Ellen, I am looking to you for the, for the answer on that one, if you have one. I'm sorry, I was reading one of the questions in the chat. Can you just repeat it for me real quick? Yeah, yeah. Katrina's question is, what is a good profit margin a small home business should aim to achieve? And then ideally, how long should you make that profit margin before changes should be considered? It's a very complex question without just one simple answer because it kind of varies on your business. Um, I'd say in terms of margins, like product profit margins, when I'm working with clients, I'm always trying to keep them at an average of a 50% margin across their retail and wholesale. And I say average because for really small companies, a lot of times selling into wholesale at a 50% margin. So that would mean you make the product for $5, you sell it for 10 is not possible. Cause say for example, you're selling retail, you want the retail price to be 10. To sell into wholesale, your wholesale stores would wanna see a price of about five. And for you to make that 50% margin yourself, now your costs have to be at 250. And you heard Marilee say, for example, on one of her examples, she charges the farm $4 for her processing fee for the product. So you know, you're not going to reach 250 a lot of times in these small batches. So that's why I say an average, because a lot of times it still does make sense to have some wholesale sales. Um, Grace went over. Sale gives you gives you uh, 
gives you exposure to a larger market, more people see you possibly than you're going to meet just one-on-one. -on -one. And so there is a reason to have wholesale, even if you're not making as much money from it. So I always want to kind of steer people away from getting too locked in on just having one number that if they can't meet it, then all hope is lost because there is something that happens in the balance of having some direct sales opportunities and some wholesale wholesale sales opportunities. And they kind of bring two different sides um, to the business overall. So I hope that's helpful. The the shortest answer to your question is I would try for an overall margin for your products to stay at 50%. So that obviously would mean retail, you're actually making a large, a higher margin than that. Typically say you're making like 70% selling direct to the consumer. And then maybe at wholesale, you're only making say 40 or something like that. Depends again, how much you're selling in one channel versus the other, but getting you to try to at least stay at that 50%. And that's a generalized answer because it really has to do with what is that trying to cover? Because the other 50%, you know, the the five dollars per jar has to cover your costs. So then it that are outside of your cost of goods. So then it begs the question, well, what are those expenses, which is going to be somewhat specific to each business. And so do you recommend people having an average of or farmers trying to achieve an average of 50 percent margin? Um, for like a specific period of time before scaling or there's like the second piece of this question of how long should someone try to maintain this margin before making any changes? Mm. No, I mean, people, how people scale is so different. Um, so I guess I would break down that question a little differently. Possibly this uh, addresses like the root of what you're asking. Scaling, really a lot of what scaling has to do with is your capacity. So you want to scale when you have the capacity, when you have the people, when, when there's going to be a way to move that inventory and when your business has the capacity to actually oversee it. So that's kind of more... Um, when, you know, you, it's not really like a thing of like, because with scaling, your costs can completely change. It's like a new landscape of your costing. So it's not really tied to how you kept a margin in a different scenario of your business, you know, making something yourself in 50 batch units in a commercial kitchen versus like scaling to the point where you're in grocery, say, those are kind of very two different looking businesses and people do make those transitions. But the the reason for that transition is not that you met a certain margin in the way you were doing it to fit a different scale. I hope that makes sense. That made sense to me, Katrina, feel free to um, follow up via the chat if you wanna add any specifics. Um, I was uh, kind of assuming the changes that they mentioned were like one of them being scaling, um, but that also might not be. Oh, I guess Katrina did. She's, Katrina said, the second part of my question more for the beginner, how long should it take to get you to that profit margin? And if you don't get there, you should change something. Mm. Uh, so I'll just kind of speak to the value added producer grant a little bit, since that's partly what we're talking about. When I, I talked to one of the reviewers uh, recently, and she said in, and when they're doing a review, she said, which this was like a new thing to me. I was like, wow, that's great to know. So I'll share it with you. Um, when they're looking at a business idea for feasibility. So this is the U.S., the U.S. government kind of looking at a business idea and saying, would we want to invest in this? So I think that's a great thing for us all to understand because it's in a way what we're doing when we look at these business ideas we have for ourselves, because it is us that's investing in this. 
So the way they look at it, they say they want to see a break even within three to five years of the post grant period. So that would be for those that's that's uh, you know anywhere from like a three to six year span, or sorry, a three to eight year span. They'd want to see a break even. Now, for you and your personal business, can you afford not to break even in that much time? If you're the one who's investing the money, I'm guessing no. So the, 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 the USDA is looking at it that way because, you know, they're putting up this grant money with the aim of helping a farm get to a place where they break even. But if it's your money that you're investing in this idea, when do you need to see it pay off? Can you wait five years for it to pay off? Most small farms can't. That's why for the most part, like with the clients that I work with, and I feel like Marilee, you could also answer to this. You really want to see that it's paying off really right away in the first year or two. Like you wouldn't want to put your business at risk of putting all this money in inventory that you can't sell or that when you sell is losing you money is, 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 an, is a loss in your business. Marilee, would you agree with that? Emma, Emma, I can I can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yes, I would totally agree with with our customers. I mean, the saddest thing in in the years that I've been doing this is hearing back from somebody who didn't sell through their previous year's inventory before the next harvest season. That was that was only I can only think of two people, two two farms who who had that issue. Um, most of them uh, were able to sell through right away and did uh, and did find a small profit. And, you know, I, I, I work with these numbers as well with margins and all that stuff. But, you know, I was in the restaurant business years ago and um, and somebody said to me, you don't put margins in the bank, you put dollars. So you know, margins is a way to, you know, to measure year over year or product over product. But really, I would say stay close to what are your what are your actual dollars, dollars doing? Yeah, um, I love that, Marilee. Yeah. I feel like margins is a great when you're talking small scale margins is a great tool to understand if I put if I make this product at the end of the day, am I going to be losing money? Cause it actually took me more money to produce it than what I'm selling it for, which believe me, I've worked with plenty of people that when I first start working with them, that is true. So it's yep. just like something to avoid. But yep. then at the end of the day, one thing Marilee spoke to in her presentation, which I loved is value added products is a way to keep money in the bank through seasons when there aren't as many things yep. to sell to do that otherwise. So as yeah. long as you're using that understanding of margins to make sure that when you make that sale, it wasn't actually a loss overall, I think you're good. And thinking of it that way, more than getting too obsessed with trying to meet one number before you move right. to a different phase. Or even, probably... even trying to, to, to be, quote, profitable. I mean, cash flow is king. Mm -hmm. Cash flow trumps profitability every time. I have a friend who's been in the food business for 25 years. I, I'm not sure that she broke to profitability until maybe year 15, um, but her cash flow was always good. So it's another another thing to think about and way to mm -hmm. think about it. Thank you both for those detailed responses. Um, we have a, had another question just come through. Um, and I see there are kind of some um, responses in the chat to a question about body products. Mm. Um, and so it sounds like maybe, Sherry, I don't know if you want to add informa more information to the chat about what specific resources you're looking for, and we can help direct you to those. Another question that came through is any resources or ideas for how to sell products? I'm one of the farms in that category. I still have many cases of last year's hot sauce that I'm currently only selling at farmer's markets. We're only able to sell a few bottles per market. I Can I, uh, I think there are lots of ways to do that. Um, and one of which is 
you know, if you're, if you have many restaurants in your area, restaurants are oftentimes very happy to sell a very local product or to, I mean, to buy it and use it. Any restaurant that puts hot sauce on their tables. I did that years ago when PFK had their own brand and made my hot sauce available at Acme Burger, which is a burger company here. Um, that's that's one. Um, and if, it, 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 Ellen, I think you can speak to this more, but if you only have one channel, it's going to be challenging. So if it's only farmer's markets, could you... Could you get on some of the aggregating, you know, online retailers like Good Eggs or Thrive or those companies? Could you sell it on Amazon? Could you do fulfillment yourself and sell it online? Um, uh, there, there are probably others that I'm not thinking of at the moment. Yeah, I love those, Marilee. And I'd also... Um... Just looking at your farmer's market, probably my first question to you, if we could, you know, go back and forth in the conversation would be how many people are coming through your farmer's market? You're saying you're only selling a few bottles. So if it was a really small farmer's market, that might be the max that you really could sell through that market. If it's a pretty busy market and you're only selling a few bottles, then I'd think, wow, there might be more opportunity there than you're currently actually capturing. Um, so the first thing that I would recommend you do is look at your packaging, look at the signage at the farmer's market from the perspective of someone who knows nothing about your farm, who's never tasted the product or seen the product and make sure that the way that you're communicating to a person who doesn't know the product, because I find a lot of times farmers will speak about their products as if they'll speak about the things that are important to them about the product and not necessarily the thing that's important to the customer who's buying it. So the people who do currently buy the product have a conversation with them. Why do they love it? Why are they buying it? Why are they choosing to buy hot sauce from you rather than especially hot sauce, the millions of options that they have of buying hot sauce and through those conversations, understand what is it about your product that makes it special to the people who are buying it and then make sure that's really reflected in your signage, have a real, like actually dedicate a part of your table to a nice display, use some vertical space even. I don't know if you have risers that you're putting the product on. So there's really like a part of your display that has the product over it. We're about to go into holiday time. So I really highly recommend try making a little gift pack out of it, put a bow on it. Um, do something to just do keep thinking about how you draw more attention to the product and explain the product clearly so that customers are enticed to buy it. Instead of, I know a lot of farmers, you're so busy trying to do so many things that sometimes that product is just like put on a table and the idea is that it will sell. But there is kind of this next step that's actually like taking the customer, leading them down the path to that first sale so that they want to buy it again. Okay. If you're interested in a lot of the great ideas Marilee said, I'm just going to like uh, give in another resource when it comes to wholesale and how to get into wholesale and how to contact wholesale buyers. I really haven't seen a resource as good as Ali Ball's Retail Ready program. And all, she has a lot of free resources too about how to write those types of emails and things like that. So if you do have some local markets in the area that you think you could get your product into, but you're kind of overwhelmed and intimidated by that process, I definitely say to go check her out. Yeah. And I, I just want to emphasize something that you, you touched on. Um, if even, even if you've got the most beautiful display in the world, if you are not actively talking to the people coming to your mark, to your table, and and introducing them to your hot sauce it will still sit there so you know offer i don't can you do tastes at farmers markets still can you do little you can do little portion cups right like do a salsa do a chip with some of your hot whatever um you really have to actively actively sell talk communicate 
Thank you both so much. Those ideas are really helpful and great to hear. Um, it is a little past one, so I'm going to move us along in the presentation. We just have a couple other announcements, but thank you both so much for joining us. And um, yeah, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now. So um, just a few announcements before we wrap up here. Um, CAF has a couple of resources um, that you all may want to check out. We have a wildfire recovery fund that's launching for a second round. Um, so if your farm or ranch was impacted by wildfires between 2020 and 2022, there are other eligibility requirements. We encourage you to check that out and apply. Applications are due November 6th. And then our annual survey um, for farmers, land stewards, and community food growers is out and will close on November 15th. So please fill that out and share your voice with us. It really helps shape CAF's policy priorities for the coming year. And then just as a reminder, the a recording of this presentation and the PDF will be emailed to you in a, the next couple of days. And you'll also have an activity that accompanies today's presentation. Um, please attend the rest of the webinar series using the same link that you used to attend this one. And then feel free to follow up with me and I can connect you to one of the presenters here if needed. My email is grace at calf.org.